If science tells us how things work, spiritual principles teach us how we apply them in our lives. So when we hear something new and make a shift in our mind, in our heart, and in our body, we make room for wisdom to emerge within us. This podcast is created to help you and me to get to know ourselves more, now more than ever, as our global family is going through a massive shift. Because the better we know ourselves, the better we'll be equipped to embrace life's extremes. Each episode will have a guest or a message that marries both science and spirituality on topics such as mindset, health, personal growth, and business. I'm your host, Arabelle, and welcome to Being Human. So, Shimpia, first of all, please allow me to pay my humble obeisance from here. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be joining your program. Secondly, thank you so much for being here on the Being Human podcast. We are so honored that you decided to set aside some time to share your wisdom with us, especially at a time like this. So my first question to you is, from your point of view, what do you think is happening in the world right now? What does it say about us humans on an individual and on the collective level? I don't want to act as a seer, (laughs) and I'm not one. But from what I can see is that we human beings need a reminder a reminder that um, we need to be mindful in living on this planet as an individual and also as a member of the community. The first thing that I'd like to highlight is, according to Buddhist philosophy, we emphasize the law of interdependence. The law of interdependence, our pain and joy are related to each other. I can only be successful if there are many other people who are successful. If there are many other people who are in pain, it's inevitable that I will be in pain. So this awareness of the law of interdependence is very important. Individually, when we become frustrated for something very small, some petty reason, that can trigger fight and flight in our emotion. With that, we disconnect ourselves from other people. So this is where antisocial behavior comes in. Antisocial behavior in terms of thinking, in terms of speed, this can be between individuals, it can be between neighbors, it can be between two companies, it can be between two ministries in the government, it can be two neighboring countries. We tend to trigger fight and flight mode and disconnect ourselves from others. Not just with human beings, in this particular case, I should emphasize also with other living beings, such as animals. So if we don't recognize them as having the right to live in this world on this planet, just like us, then we don't show respect to the animals, the the SARS and the MERS and now this uh, COVID-19, they remind us how we should treat the animals. Of course, this treatment, this respectful treatment, mindful treatment also uh, extends to human beings as well. So to repeat my point, the law of interdependence means uh, we share this world with everyone. We share this world with everyone. And, And I think this pandemic, just reminds us that, okay, we cannot live alone. To protect ourselves, we have to protect other people. If we expose ourselves to any danger, we expose our family, our loved one, and everyone to danger. And when other people are threatened, there's no way that we can be safe. So the law of dependence. Thank you so much for highlighting the fact that we are all connected. And for me personally, I feel that this moment, this situation, this crisis is reminding all of us that every single action that one person, one individual takes has a massive impact on another person. And also thank you for speaking on behalf of the animals. Just one question. Does that mean that treating animals with respect, does that mean that should we become vegetarians? Or is that a personal choice? What are your thoughts on that, 
选票啊。我 that's a personal choice. I happen to be vegetarian, but I wouldn't like to impose this on other people. But it has been proven scientifically that okay, living as a vegetarian is possible. Of course, even for non-vegetarians, this still should treat the animals. With respect, the dairy industry has been in the news quite often. How we treat them, and we merely treat them as food, sometimes as a business. I don't think there's a healthy attitude. So we should treat them as a living animal with feeling. Look, a cow also has so much love for its calf, and this is what we should recognize. We as a human being, we should be. A lot more intelligent than some of our actions you know, have portrayed. So I would like to make a point that okay, we as a human being, we should have more humility when we treat animals. And the the word animal, sometimes you know, in in the phrase we use, is very downgraded. So if the word animals doesn't have that connotation anymore. That would show that we, as a human being, we know how to respect us ourselves as a human being and also other living creatures in this planet. Thank you so much for speaking to that. My next question is: As you know, there are many people who are in a state of fear and panic right now, and understandably so, as the current situation is actually threatening the livelihood of many people. What do you think is the most simplest and fastest way for people to bring themselves back to a state of calmness and equilibrium? I better go along with the philosophy of interdependence again. So my simple advice is to stay connected. To stay connected doesn't mean that you read, okay, all the news on your mobile and disconnect yourself emotionally with your neighbors. No. Just for example, people in a, in a lockdown situation, and you have to live at home all the time. Now, even with members of your family, it's still find it difficult to spend so much time with each other. So here, when you feel tense, when you feel like a, a little bit of congested in your heart, no longer spacious in your feeling, what you should do is that you should take slow and deep breathing. About three times, slow and deep breathing. Neurologically, this one is to calm your brain because only with calmness, the prefrontal cortex, the brain that has that is associated with executive brain, will start working. When you are under pressure, a lot of stress because you have to stay home, you trigger the fight and flight, fight and flight mode. In neurology, the amygdala, that is the old brain. Then that means okay, you disconnect even with the people nearest and dearest to you, your family members. If you can quarrel with them, you can quarrel with anyone in the world. If you fight with them, you're fighting with the whole world. They are an example of the whole world, and they are part of you. So here. By stepping back and giving yourself maybe about two three minutes, take that slow and deep breathing. You change your brain position from the old brain to the new brain, from the amygdala to the、uh, prefrontal cortex. And in terms of emotion, from stress, you move to calmness. Maybe that calmness will last. For a very short while, if you don't continue, but nevertheless, that gives you a window of opportunity to reconnect with your loved one. Okay, I'm frustrated because I have to stay at home all the time. Maybe my children, maybe my other family members feel the same. If you reconnect with them, now you start calming yourself. This calmness will have an impact on your family members. With them. Getting a little bit calmer, that will help you to get even more calm. You see how we are interrelated. So the, my point is that when you are very stressed out, it's no good to disconnect. Actually, you need to reconnect. To reconnect either with pain or joy. With pain, I have already explained using frustration as an example. But with joy, you can. The majority of the people in the world, we can still see. We're at home. We can't go anywhere. Yes, but we are healthy. 
We have things that are essential to us. We can still look to tomorrow. And by staying at home, if you have the right attitude, if you have positive thinking, you're actually helping the whole world. I would go as far as in the Buddhist terminology, we call this offering of life. We say, Zivita Dana, that's offering of life. Charity, that is nourishing life. You are just staying at home, looking after yourself. But this action is very important because you are giving a lot of life. You are giving life to many people. I would say a little price that we can and that we should pay in order to help as many as we can in the world, not just in our country, but also in many other countries. Thank you so much for sharing that. I 100% believe in that. I have a lot of students and clients. And one of the things that I teach about is energy. And a lot of us feel that in order to do good things, we have to donate and do charitable things in terms of money and material things. But I say that if what happens when you don't have things or money to donate to help others, then we have something that's the most powerful thing, which is our energy and our state of mind. And when we stay in that place, when we stay center and grounded, then we are actually doing a massive contribution, especially at the time like this, to the entire planet right now. And each person, when we can do that collectively, that will have a massive impact on the collective consciousness, no doubt. My next question is, Seattle, as you know, life is a duality and every polar opposite exists in every situation. And even though the current situation is perceived to be negative, I know that there are so many benefits. But from your point of view, what do you think are the benefits or how do you think this situation is actually helping people in a positive way? Usually in my own practice and also in my teaching, I emphasize uh, two qualities as emotion management. One is compassion, the other is joyful exercise. Joyful exercise. In order to develop joy, actually, we need to start noticing good things in our life. From what I have seen in my life, there are more hardworking people than lazy people. I am lazy sometimes, but if I look back my whole life, I would like to describe myself as a hardworking person. And a lot of my friends, my teachers, my students, I see them in that way. Now, the good thing is that people come to their consciousness that they cannot be safe alone. So they start doing something good. The two countries I'm most familiar with, I have been resident in England since 96, since four or five years ago. I have also been coming back to Myanmar and spent my time maybe half of the year here. So in this, these two countries, from what I noticed during this pandemic is that a lot of people have come out to help other people. And this is a good thing. But as a human being, I want to emphasize here, we have more capacity to do this and it doesn't have to take a pandemic. It doesn't have to. You see, getting up in the morning, we are ready to connect. Even if we look at our mobile phone, we can, but this one, it cannot function alone. It needs a lot of electricity, a lot of engineers, a lot of IT engineers, a lot of investment. So in this little telephone, if I have that mindset, I can actually connect with many people I don't know. Many people that I don't know. I can connect with them. By connecting with them, I feel good that, I feel good to know that actually there are many people out there who are working hard <clears throat> to make my life more convenient and safer. So, the first thing is to, to feel joyful that I have this telephone to connect with many people. Rejoicing in, in what I have, what I can do. Uh, this is good. This is good. This is the, the very foundation. But if I focus on myself too much, I will become self-centered. I will start losing my connection with other people. So what is important then? 
to find in this telephone the contribution by other people who have made it possible for me to be talking to you now, for me to be uh, calling somebody else, then that doesn't take many seconds. With that, emotionally, we are connected with even the people we don't know, even the people we have never met. This is very important. We recognize the role of other people in our success, in our happiness. Not only that, this doesn't dampen our happiness, actually enriches our happiness. To acknowledge the role of my parents and my teachers and, and all the taxpayers in my success, it does me no harm. Instead, I feel safer because I know these are good people who want me to succeed. So we need to emphasize this point about how human beings by nature, how we are designed to care, to nourish each other. In this pandemic, like many other pandemics that the world faced before, there may be people who like to, to score political gain, personal point, that sort of thing. But they are negligible. We need to focus on good people, a positive thing. And if we do so, we might be able to prevent another pandemic. So learning from this is very important emotionally and learning to connect. Just look at some countries like in 2003, the part of the world which were hard hit by, by the SARS, maybe Hong Kong, maybe Taiwan, they learned that. And look, okay, the proximity to mainland China, we all know that they are less affected than many other people say in America, in Europe. This is about learning, this is about caring. Good and bad, when they come together, we look at the painful one and we develop compassion. But we will be able to do so only if we stay connected with our family members, our neighbors, our fellow global citizens that we find when we read the news on, on this handset. Just to take in the news is not enough. We need to try to connect with them emotionally connect with their pay. And there are many people who are working round clock now in every continent, okay, in their own way. Some people in small villages, some people in small towns, some people at the national level, some people at the global level. Many of them, if we recognize their good heart, their compassion, this will have a very positive impact for us in the future. Thank you for, so much for sharing that. Shintia, you mentioned just earlier that we don't need a pandemic to remind us of the fact that we are caring by nature, but which is a very positive view of looking at things. And I think a lot of us should think and see things more in that perspective. At the same time, from observing all these pandemics or crises that has happened in just different shapes and forms all over the world over the last 20, 30, 40 decades, or even 100 years, I notice that sometimes we forget when in crisis, we go through certain things and then things get better. And as human beings, sometimes we get complacent and we forget. Like earlier this year in Australia, we had a big bushfire pretty much all over the country. And a lot of people lost homes, uh, nearly, if I'm not wrong, 6,000 buildings were destroyed and a billion animals died. And some of those will go extinct. And it took us that fire to remind us that how we have been living, doing, and also destroying our planet, although that wasn't our intention, even if it is just buying a plastic bag or just grabbing any plastic bags that we see when we go to grocery. And now I see a lot of people bringing their own bags and reusing bags. And it took that fire for us to remember that. And for me, as you said, in times of crisis, especially, I think it's really important for us to have that attitude of gratitude, which you mentioned quite a lot. But for me, my question is, if this situation, this current crisis is a message from Mother Earth or from the universe or from nature, what do you think that message is for us as humans? What do you think it's reminding us? The message is very clear that we have no planet B. 
We have nowhere else to run. Now, the COVID-19 is ravaging UK, every continent. We actually don't have another place to go. So and the message that we get from every government, national, international, including WHO, stay home. Stay home means we only have this home, no other home. And if you imagine this home, not your home with the postcode, but home with which is this planet, what does it mean? It means we need to stay in this planet. When we stay at home, what do we do? We take a lot of care to wash our hands, a lot of care to disinfect, okay, everywhere, the door handles, you know, that we use every day. All of a sudden, we become suspicious of things around us, that they may be infectious. So we take good care of our immediate environment. Then just imagine for a second that this immediate environment is the whole planet. If we care about the whole planet as much as we care about our little home, we don't need planet B. This planet, the only planet, is good enough for us. You mentioned complacency. I think we cannot blame people for this. We are kind of sleepwalk into this. Look at the system, education system, the economic system, the political system. There's just so much competition. Competition is poisonous. Okay, it has a lot of side effects. We use competition in order to motivate people. But the price that we pay is that a lot of side effects to this competition, to this motivational technique. So if you know, like in, the, in Denmark, for example, in their school, there's no competition. Instead, they teach empathy. It's by law from six years old to, to 16 years old. Now from, from 1993 that they have been doing this, but culturally, they have been doing this since 1870s. So more than a hundred years. So now it's in their DNA not to compete, but to empathize. So they teach students to listen to each other and also to express with courage and, and with confidence. I think finding this balance is very important. We can do so if we reduce as much as possible the competition mechanism in every aspect of our life. But with competition, with competitive mind, and using competition as motivation, we never feel that we have enough. We do, we do have enough. A lot of people, they do have enough, but they don't feel that. When they don't feel that, when they don't feel they have enough, sharing with other people is the last thing they would do. Excuse me, we are sharing this planet, and if we forget how to share, if we think that we need to work for ourselves, we need to look after ourselves without considering about the pain and joy of other people, where we are going, we are sleepwalking into pandemic after pandemic, from a bushfire to another bushfire. You know, we are sleepwalking into this. So it is very important that we remind ourselves that we are part of a bigger, a bigger, you know, bigger world. Uh, human and animals and an ecological system. So we come back to the law of interdependence. If we have been sleepwalking into these things, I believe that this is a pivotal time for us to wake up and make different choices in our lives because obviously the choices that we have made or we have been making, uh, most of them are not working. So if we were to just simply make new choices, that will not only support ourselves but also our families our communities and the whole planet what choices do you think they would be and what would you suggest people to what kind of choices should we start making as a bite-sized advice i don't want to mention about the choices because it can be a little bit bossy when i'm about to have my breakfast for example i have toast now i need to be uh, rejoicing in my ability I work hard so that I have food on the table. This is called mindful eating. Mindful eating is part of mindful living. Then I need to spend maybe about 10 seconds to, to use 
my toes, okay, to connect with other people. First of all, the farmer and the people who invented the machine. Now that's the agricultural part. What about the commercial part for the crop to come into the market? So that toes, that piece of toes, enable me, helps me to connect with my fellow citizens. It only takes me 10 seconds. They all play a part in me having a good breakfast seat. Every time I do that, I stay connected. I'm connected with my fellow human being. By being connected in that way, I'm reducing my ego, my self-centeredness. At the same time, I retain my self-confidence, confidence in my own ability. So the middle way, the middle part that the Buddha talks about is, on the one hand, not to go to the extreme of being too self-centered to the point of disconnecting with everyone. On the other, to actually fear, you recognize the other people to the extent that you lose your self-identity. So the middle way, the way that my, my story of a Little Breakfast tells you is that it's possible to connect with them. By connecting with them, I feel warmer, I feel safer. So with this, I think we will be more mindful of our action. Decision maker will be more mindful of their decision, the impact of their decision, not just to score uh, electoral points, and companies, they would be more mindful of the planet they live in, not just for the benefit. Because sometimes business people, they say, no, we are not for charity, we are business. What does it mean? Do you do business at the expense of the planet? If you do so, when other people are not safe, you won't be safe. What I have taken away from this very powerful share you just did, Seattle, and first of all, thank you so much, is we are now, most of us are now living in a very fast-paced world, and most, a lot of us are acting like robots, being in our heads, just focusing on what we need to do with a very tunnel vision, and we forget to connect to our hearts. That's what I took away from your, from your share, is to connect to our hearts, because when we are in our hearts, we're not that fast paced anymore. We slow down a little bit more and we become a little bit more self-aware. We become a little bit more mindful. Then we put a little more thought into the things that we do. And that, be, that helps us connect to not just our emotions and our heart, but also to the people around us that we may not have thought about before and become more grateful about the things that we have in our lives. And at the same time, the biggest thing that I took away from that was to not take, take things for granted because now we have running waters, we have meat and veg, vegetables in the grocery stores. We forget what it's like to hunt and to grow our own food. It becomes so easy that we start to take things for granted. And if this situation is a blessing in disguise, then it is actually reminding us to pause, to slow down a little bit and to go back to the basics a little bit. That's, that's my take on it. I like to add just, just one sentence. Some of the beauties of life, you can see them only when you slow down. A lot of beauties in life, but you can only see many of them if you slow down. Yeah. The beauty that, um, that come from the good heart of your family members being there for you. But uh, if you're so busy, you have no time for yourself and certainly not for them. Meaning you don't see a lot of beauties in yourself and in other people. You become goal-oriented that uh, um, uh, a lot of beauties remain hidden. I totally agree. And um, I would like to ask something that is very personal and yet something that's happening to a lot of people right now. And again, because of the situation that we are experiencing, many people are losing their jobs and their businesses, and that's affecting their livelihood. Here in Australia, it is said that average household has only $7,000 
uh, in their bank because we have to pay for mortgage, rent, bills, and all these things that doesn't even last them more than three months. And I'm sure it's similar to other people in other countries in their own currencies. And so that means that the anxieties are sky high and people are finding it really hard to adjust and manage the current situation. So from your point of view and from your practices, what, uh, what can we do in, in the current situation to reduce the anxiety a little bit? I go back to the philosophy I started with, that the law of interrelatedness. To put it in another way, this is the universality of, of pain, of suffering. You mentioned every household has about seven thousand dollars on average. Actually, to know that you are not alone, that other people are on the same boat. Actually, this should reassure you. This is the first point I like to make: to stay connected. Okay, between your suffering and other people's suffering, between your anxiety and other people's anxiety. The worst thing you can do is to disconnect yourself and to feel lonely in facing this problem. But if we don't disconnect from other people, uh, we will feel less lonely and the pressure will be bearable. In this instant, okay, when we wake up, we should remember, okay, in our bank there are only 7K. And the same with my neighbor, this side, that side, my neighbor, they, they also have the same. If that's the case, that should motivate you to find a solution. Collectively, if we act out of compassion, this is to, to ensure that the most vulnerable in the society, they are protected. With that in mind, with that, I mean, we have most vulnerable in most families, either elderly or the younger ones, you know, in mo most families have them. Meaning, when we think about a way out, if we consider also about other people, then our voice will be heard by the decision makers. So every, everybody, we have to take some pain. Now every family is already undergoing a lot of stress. If we come together, connected, and collectively start considering what we can do, I think there is always a way out. We have come so far. I don't think this pandemic will destroy us. I believe it will strengthen us. Yes. But we need to stay connected. I want to emphasize, I cannot emphasize enough this word, stay connected. Because stay at home, sometimes it can mean being disconnected from other people physically. Even if you are disconnected physically, these days, with all the communication technology, it's not difficult to stay connected with the whole world. Now, as a practice, what I do, before I check news on my device, I take deep breath and I tell myself, I'm going to observe pain, pain from the whole world. And when I come across an upsetting news, that's how I relate to them. I relate to them. I relate to um, the people who are in pain. Neurologically, the scientists who have done research on mindfulness, they say, neurologically, if we stay connected with pain of other people, is the prefrontal cortex, the area of our brain that activate. But if we just look at the news, without connecting with other people's pain, we disconnect, we become frightened, we develop more and more fear. So we start panic buying, we start a lot of things, a lot of irrational behaviors we come in. Why? Because with all the information flooding into our head, we forget to connect. And my last question is something that you have repetitively mentioned, which is compassion. What is compassion and how can we have more compassion towards ourselves first and then to the people around us? And then, yeah, my second question related to that is how can we nurture ourselves more at a time like this when stress levels are 
so high in the collective that even if we're trying not to feel that, sometimes we automatically or subconsciously tune into the collective what they're feeling and we start to feel that energy as well. So how can we practice more compassion and more nurturing in our lives? I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step answer on this. Before compassion, we have two steps. The first step is sympathy. Sympathy is about understanding someone's pain, understanding the pain if you're in Australia, understanding the pain of New Zealand, the pain of the people in Singapore, in China, in Europe. You understand the figure, you understand the logic, but there's no connection heart to heart. You do not emotionally share their pain. So to emotionally share their pain, this is empathy to empathize with them. After you think you have understood what's going on, then take a bit of time, maybe half a minute, just to look inside yourself. What is like for doctors and nurses to be working round the clock in the atmosphere of fear, fear from this pandemic. Just try to imagine a little bit what it's like to have a family member infected. What is it like to have a family member quarantine? What is it like for a decision maker running any level of the country? It's because the events are changing so fast that decision making cannot catch up with that. This happened in most countries. So if we spend a, a bit of time empathizing with those people, now we are ready for compassion. So before compassion, first sympathy, then empathy. Compassion necessarily involves action. with the action. What people usually call compassion is actually empathy, not the exact compassion. I'm talking uh, this from a Buddhist uh, meditation teacher point of view, from Buddhist scriptures, and also from scientific point of view. I like to um, refer to a book for anyone who is interested. About three years old a book, you know, published by Oxford University. It's called the Oxford Handbook of Compassion Science. We all agree that Compassion has a pragmatic component. So now, we, you know, after we have empathized with all the pain that people go through, economically, socially, and emotionally, after we have recognized all these things, now it's time to ask a simple question what I can do to help. Staying at home is one thing that you help with other people. Taking care of yourself is another. Retaining positive thinking, positive outlook, positive emotion, and sharing that with your friends is another thing that you can do. Because there are many uh, top scientists who are working around the clock to find a remedy. Uh, there are medical professionals around the world uh, who put themselves at risk just to save other people's lives. There are people like um, the bankers, the, the staff in the banking industry uh, who go to work just to ensure that the economy functions at least um, for the essential ones. So we have many people doing this. What we can do, what we can do, of course, for people who have more, they can share more. What we have may be different from each, from one another. Some people, they have more ideas. Some people, they have more uh, positive emotion. Some people, they have more money. Some people, they have more influence. Some people, they have more calmness in themselves. Each of us, we have something within us that we can share. If we share with the sole intention of reducing the pain so that everybody suffers less, this is compassion.
Thank you so much for sharing that and speaking on such a very important topic. So, um, Ciara, thank you so much for your time and your presence here on this podcast and this interview. I am deeply humbled and extremely grateful from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the entire community who will be watching or listening this interview. So we wish you a very beautiful and a very pleasant and peaceful day ahead. And once this interview is out, we will definitely let you know. I also would like to take this opportunity to wish you and all the listeners and their family to have good health, long life, resilience, above all, and the ability to connect deeply with human beings and animals and the ecology. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you haven't yet, please make sure you leave a five-star review on iTunes. That way I could bring more people to inspire you to live your best life. Also, don't forget to connect with me on Instagram. Just look up Arabelle Yee. Take care and talk to you again in the next episode.